In the first part of the film, Jesus Christ and the Macedonians, we proved that during the time of some significant events described in the Old and the New Testament, a large colony of Macedonians lived in the Holy Land and actively participated or witnessed the creation or portions of the Bible. We continue to present evidence of the contribution of the Macedonians to the spreading of Christianity. In addition to the Macedonians living in the Holy Land, the Macedonians in Macedonia also made significant contributions to Christianity. Many famous biblical figures have visited Macedonia. According to some church beliefs, one of the key figures in Christianity had visited Macedonia, and that is Saint Mary the Virgin herself. Today, the biography of the Holy Mother of God is preserved, which describes her life from birth to her death. After the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Holy Virgin, along with the Apostles and other Christians, continued to spread Christianity. She mainly preached the Word of God in the Holy Land, but at one point she decided to visit Cyprus supporters, who repeatedly invited her. During her trip to Cyprus, the Holy Mother of God also briefly visited Macedonia, specifically Mount Athos on the Halkidiki Peninsula. The visit of the Holy Mother of God to Macedonia is described in her biography written by the monk Saint Stephan who lived on Mount Athos. The Most, the most Holy, Holy Mother, Mother of God, of God got, on got on a boat. boat. Together, Together with, with the, the beloved, beloved disciple of Christ, Christ the, Virgin the Virgin John, John and, their and their other devout, devout followers. followers. The boat, the boat sailed, sailed to Cyprus. To Cyprus. But suddenly, suddenly the opposite, the opposite wind, wind blew and landed, landed the boat at the port of Mount Athos. Then we read that when the Macedonians heard about the arrival of the Holy Mother of God, many came out to meet her and see her. Everyone, Everyone headed, headed to the, to the seaside, seaside in the mentioned, the mentioned harbor, harbor, looking at the, looking boat, at the boat and the Mother, mother of God. God. They, greeted they greeted her with her great honors, honors and at their gathering, gathering asked her. Asked her. What kind of God did you give birth to and how do we name him? The Most Holy Mother, opening his divine mouth, told the people all about Jesus Christ. Then all the people fell to the ground, and they all bowed their heads and gave her great honors, her who bore him. The Holy Mother of God was visibly touched by this reception by the Macedonians. Because of this, she addressed them with the words, This place shall be a part of me and of my Son and my God. May God's grace rule this place and the inhabitants here, who, by faith and piety, keep the commandments of my Son and my God. Everything they need for life on earth they will have in abundance and without much effort and their heavenly life will be ready. And by the end of the time they will not take from this place the mercy of my son. And I will be the protector of this place and its wholehearted advocate before God. Then the Holy Mother of God left one of her followers to the Macedonians as their teacher and again blessed them. Further on, we read that the Virgin entered the boat and travelled to Cyprus. The Holy Mother of God visited Macedonia in the first century and this is precisely the time when the ancient Macedonians living in Macedonia were still living under Roman occupation. Their life under the Romans was extremely difficult, but they no longer had the power to raise a new uprising against this cruel regime. Perhaps that is why the Macedonians welcomed the Holy Mother of God with joy. She herself came from a land under slavery to the Romans, and the new Christian faith made all people equal to God, slaves and masters. That is why the Macedonians embraced Christianity, seeing in it a salvation from their misfortune. 
the visit of the Holy Mother of God to Macedonia is officially recognised by the Macedonian Orthodox Church. Some historians deny the claim that the Holy Mother of God was staying in Macedonia. However, the fact is that the Holy Virgin did indeed travel outside the Holy Land, accompanied by the young Saint John and other followers of Jesus. Evidence of this is the house near the town of Ephesus in Asia Minor, which is located today in Turkey near the Aegean Sea coast, where the Holy Mother of God really resided. This house exists today and is under the protection of the Turkish state. It's popularly known as the House of the Virgin Mary. It is believed that the Holy Mother of God spent the last moments of her life there. So if the Holy Mother of God was indeed staying in Ephesus, and if this information is acknowledged today, not only by Christians, but also by Muslims and certainly by the official Turkish authorities, it is likely that she did indeed stay in Macedonia which is only a few hundred kilometers away from Ephesus. Jesus' apostle and evangelist Saint John, who is also the author of the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, stayed in Macedonia as well. The Gospel of John is already thought to have been written in Alexandria, meaning that it was written among the descendants of the Macedonians who settled there. As for the visit of Macedonia by the Holy Evangelist John, we have already mentioned that during the visit of Macedonia by the Holy Mother of God, she was accompanied by Saint John. This is precisely the Holy Evangelist John, the Apostle of Jesus, who was adopted by the Holy Mother of God and accompanied her on her journey to Cyprus, during which they also stayed in Macedonia. The founder of the early Christian church, Jesus' apostle St. Peter, also lived in Macedonia. In the biography of St. Peter, we read that after the ascension of Christ, he also visited many countries where he preached Christianity. Among these countries was Macedonia. From Antioch, Peter, Peter came, came to Macedonia, Macedonia where he also appointed bishops. bishops. Olympus, Olympus of the Philippians, Philippians and, Jason and Jason of the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians. So not only did St. Peter stay in Macedonia, but he also had significant activities there where he appointed bishops for the Macedonian Christians. The Holy Evangelist Matthew, who is the author of Gospel of Matthew from the New Testament, is one of the twelve apostles of Jesus. Regarding his visit to Macedonia, in his biography we read, After traveling, After traveling from, from Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the Holy, the Holy Apostle, Apostle Matthew, Matthew preached the gospel, the gospel in many, many countries. countries. While announcing Christ, he traveled to Macedonia, Syria, Persia and Midia, as well as all of Ethiopia. If it is known that the Holy Evangelist John and Luke also stayed in Macedonia, it means that three out of four authors of the Gospels in the New Testament visited in Macedonia. Saint Andrew was Jesus' first apostle. After the ascension of Jesus, Saint Andrew preached Christianity in Russia. That is why Saint Andrew is a proclaimed patron of Russia today. St. Andrew was killed on the territory of present-day Greece. There he was crucified on a cross shaped like the letter X. Since then, crosses of this form have been named St. Andrew's Cross. In the 8th century, the remains of St. Andrew were transferred to Scotland, making him the protector of this country. In honour of St. Andrew, today's flag of Scotland has his cross on a dark blue base. It is little known to the general public that St. Andrew visited and stayed in Macedonia. Regarding this, in his biography, we read, And when, and when after, after the, the sufferings, sufferings of the Lord, the, Lord, the, resurrection, the resurrection and exaltation, St. Andrew, Andrew 
and the rest of the apostles, received the Holy Spirit, which came into him in the form of a fiery tongue. And when the lands were decided by dice, he got the lands. Bithynia, Propontis with Chalcedon and Byzantium, Thrace and Macedonia. Saint Andrew traveled these lands, preaching about Christ. More details on St. Andrew's stay in Macedonia can be found in the early Christian apocryphal manuscript entitled Acts of Andrew, where we read, At Parenthus he found a ship going to Macedonia, and an angel told him to go on board. Further on, we read that St. Andrew stayed in Philippi and in Solon, present-day Thessalonica. Everywhere he stayed, he made some miraculous healings, which is why in the apocryphal manuscript we read, his fame went through all Macedonia. At that time, Macedonia was under Roman occupation, and the Romans were pagans. When the Roman proconsul found out about the activity of St. Andrew, he was upset and sent troops to arrest him. But when the troops came to St. Andrew, along with Roman proconsul, his numerous Macedonian companions grabbed their weapons to defend him. St. Andrew prevented the bloodshed. The proconsul tried to accuse St. Andrew of being a wizard, but the Macedonians defended him. In this regard, we read, The proconsul, believe, believe not, O people, people believe, believe not the not sorcerer. The sorcerer. They said, this is no sorcery but sound and true teaching. The proconsul, I shall throw this man to the beasts and write about you to Caesar, that ye may perish for contemning his laws. They would have stoned him and said, write to Caesar that the Macedonians have received the word of God, and forsaking their idols, worship the true God. Further on, we read about the departure of St. Andrew from Macedonia, during which he was followed by many Macedonians. Many faithful from Macedonia accompanied him in two ships, and all were desirous of being on Andrew's ship to hear him. Let us briefly review St. Paul's stay in the Macedonian city of Philippi, where practically the first Christian community on the ground of Europe was formed. St. Paul is believed to have been in Philippi during the summer of 50 AD. We can safely say that the vast majority of the citizens of Philippi whom St. Paul met were ethnic Macedonians. There are historical testimonies as well as strong indications. It is well known that St. Paul and his companions in all the cities they visited first went to the Jewish synagogues to preach to the Jews about Jesus. But what happened when they came to Philippi? The description of their visit to this city does not mention any Jewish synagogue at all. This means that Jewish synagogues in Philippi then did not exist. For the Jews to be able to gather in a synagogue there must have been at least 10 Jewish men, and since there were no synagogues in Philippi, it meant that there were no Jews, or if there were, there would have been very few. From this information, we can draw a conclusion about the ethnic composition of Philippi, which was dominated by Macedonians, who have always lived in this city. We will mention one more fact about the dominant Macedonian ethnic character of Philippi. In Acts of Apostles, we read that after finding no Jewish synagogue, St. Paul and his companions went to the nearby river, where the people then prayed. In this regard, in Acts of Apostles 16.13, we read, on the, On the Sabbath, Sabbath we went we outside, outside the city, the city gate, gate to the river, the river. where we where were we expected to find a place of prayer. prayer. We, sat we sat down, down and, started and started talking to the women who had gathered, gathered there. there. Why did the people of Philippi go out to pray right by the nearby river? The answer to this question 
is the fact that ancient Macedonians cultivated a special cult of the water. In the past, they performed sacrifices to the rivers and deeply respected them. Water, as a supernatural force, remained in the folklore of the Macedonians of the 19th and 20th centuries, though it is also found in the folklore of other nations. So, the praying of the citizens of Philippi by the river was an old ancient Macedonian custom, which is another proof of the dominant Macedonian ethnic character of this city. Of course, in addition to the dominant Macedonians, there were members of other nations in Philippi as well, but we can say that they were mainly temporary settlers from different countries who sold their goods there. One of them was a woman named Lydia from the Asian city of Theatera. She was the first person to be Christianized on European soil and therefore canonized as a saint. Her hometown of Theatera was located in the northern part of the ancient Lydia region, after which the saleswoman Lydia received her personal name. The previous name of this city was Pelopia, and the name Theatera was given to it by Alexander the Great's general, who later founded the Seleucid dynasty, Seleucos Nikato. Later, this city changed a few more names, and today bears the Turkish name Akazar. Theatera is a well-known city among lovers of numismatics as well, because it was one of the first cities in the world to use money. Theatera's money depicted the character of the goddess Sibylle. This goddess is known to belong to the culture of the Phrygians. It is known that the Phrygians, while living in Macedonia, were named Brygians and had a significant ethno-cultural contribution to the formation of the ancient Macedonian people. Later, of course, ethnic changes were also made in Theatira, but it is certain that the descendants of the Phrygians continued to live in this city. Theatira first came under the control of the Persians, then for nearly two centuries it was under the rule of the Macedonians. It is quite possible at that time that Theatera was inhabited by Macedonians, and a strong indication of this is the existence of a temple of Apollo in this city, the remains of which can be seen today. The Romans conquered this city in 80 BC. So the ethnic origin of the woman Lydia cannot be ascertained. An indication that she may have been of Macedonian descent is the fact that she, along with the majority of Macedonians from Philippi, attended the prayer by the river in this town, which means that she herself adhered to this ancient Macedonian custom. But let's go back to St. Paul's stay in Philippi. It is believed that St. Paul wrote the second epistle to the Corinthians during this time in Philippi in the winter 56 and 57. And this information is recognized today by many historians. In the world-renowned issue, The Illustrated Bible for Youth, we read about this. The first epistle to the Christian community in Corinth is written in the 56th in Ephesus and the second in Macedonia in the winter of 56-57. This reveals another important moment worthy of respect, and that is the fact that parts of the New Testament were also written in Macedonia. The city of Philippi was formerly called Clenides, and the name Philippi was given in honor of Philip II of Macedonia. The oldest Christian church in Philippi is thought to have been built in the 4th century. The mosaic on the floor was dedicated to St. Paul. Apart from Philippi, St. Paul also stayed in the Macedonian cities of Amphipolis and Apollonia, after which he visited Solun, Thessalonica and Veria, where he baptized many Macedonians and Jews. 
It is known that St. Paul sent three of his epistles to the Macedonians, two to the Thessalonians and one to the Philippians. In the first epistle to the Thessalonians, St. Paul writes, And you, and became, you became imitators, imitators of, us of us and of the Lord, Lord. When, you when you welcomed, welcomed the, message the message with the joy of the, of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. In the, in the midst, midst of your of great, great suffering. suffering. As, a, As result, a result, you have become, become an, example an example to all believers in Macedonia, in Macedonia and Achaia. And Achaia. Now, now about, about brotherly, brotherly love. love. You, do you do not, not need anyone, anyone to, write to write to you. you. Because, because yourselves have been taught, taught by God, God to love one another. another. And, indeed, and indeed, you are you showing this love to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. On his third missionary journey, St. Paul came to Macedonia again. This time, he was accompanied by several Macedonians. What's interesting from this trip is the description of his stay in the Asia Minor city of Ephesus, which was mainly inhabited by Greeks. While in Ephesus, St. Paul had experienced some troubles. After he and his followers the Macedonians Gaius and Aristarchus began preaching Christianity, the Greek pagans became so angry that they became physically violent, praising their goddess Artemis of Ephesus out loud. In the Acts of Apostles, we read about this. When the, when uproar, the uproar had, had ended, ended. Paul, Paul sent for the for disciples, the disciples and, after encouraging them, them, said goodbye and set, and set out for Macedonia. Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months, because some Jews had plotted against him just as he was about to sail for Syria. He decided to go back through Macedonia. He was, he was accompanied, accompanied by Sopater, son, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Berea Aristarchus, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Thessalonica Gaius, Gaius from Derbe, Derbe Timothy, Timothy also, also, and Tychicus, Tychicus and Trophimus from the from province of Asia. Asia. We see here that Macedonia is clearly separated from the territory of Greece. St. Paul stayed in Macedonia four times in total. As a result, the first Christians to become Christians on European soil were the Macedonians, and the first Christian community in Europe was founded in Macedonia. Macedonia has a long-term tradition, but it is a young country and it has a young people. Та е символ на тоа како христијанството влезе на запад преку апостолот Павле, кој сакаше да оди во Азија, но беше повикан во Македонија. Народот во Македонија никогаш не ја пропушти можноста да не подсети дека христијанството влегло низ нивната врата. As an important biblical figure, for whom there are strong indications that he was of Macedonian ethnic origin, we will mention St. Luke the Evangelist. He is the most represented author in the New Testament, whose works have continuously powered, power and will power all generations of Christians. St. Luke wrote the key parts of the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. Before becoming a Christian, St. Luke did not belong to Judaism but was a pagan and believed in pagan gods of Balkan mythology, Zeus, Artemis, Apollo. He was not even born in the Holy Land. Here are some clues for the possible Macedonian origin of St. Luke. First, we will say that some biblical historians believe that St. Luke was born in the city of Antioch. These historians mainly rely on the writing of the early historian Eusebius of Caesarea. In the Croatian edition of the Bible we read, The first, the first information, information on Luke, Luke is drawn, drawn from, from the, the Acts, Acts of the Apostles. The, Apostles. the so-called so we parts, parts written in the first, in the first person, person plural. plural. 
According to these records, Luke was born in Syrian Antioch, probably of pagan parents, where, very early, around the year 40, he became a Christian. Paul met him in Troas on his second missionary journey, from where he took him to Philippi, where he probably left him as a pastor of the first European center of Christianity. Who founded the city of Antioch? What was its ethnic composition? Here are some facts that are little known to the general public. It is known that the city of Antioch was founded by the Macedonians, specifically by the general of Alexander the Great, and later the ruler of the state of the Seleucids, named Seleucus I, in 300 or 301 BC. The city was named after Seleucus's father, whose name was Antioch, and the city was the capital of the Macedonian kingdom of the Seleucids. There is no doubt that in the first period of its establishment, the town was predominantly inhabited by Macedonians. Later, after the fall of the Seleucid state, Antioch fell under Roman rule, but it is certain that the Macedonians remained the predominant population in the city, at least in the first period after the Roman occupation. The Jewish historian Josephus Flavius, who lived in the first century AD, mentions Macedonians as the dominant inhabitants of the city of Antioch. Flavius writes that the Macedonian ruler Seleucus granted civil rights to the Jews in Antioch and to the Macedonians in this city who were privileged there. The Jews also obtained honors from the kings of Asia when they became their auxiliaries. For Seleucus Nicator made them citizens in those cities which he built in Asia, and in the lower Syria and in the metropolis itself Antioch and gave them privileges equal to those of the Macedonians and Greeks who were the inhabitants insomuch that these privileges continue to this very day. If Flavius first mentions the Macedonians as the inhabitants of Antioch, and only afterwards the Greeks and the Jews, it is clear that they were the most indigenous inhabitants of this city. After all, this is normal, keeping in mind that Antioch was the capital of the kingdom of the Seleucids. It is also interesting that at the time of St. Paul's stay in Antioch, the local town elder had the typical Macedonian name Alexander. Even in the 6th century AD, almost eight and a half centuries after the foundation of Antioch, there are traces of its Macedonian heritage in this city. In this century, the Byzantine historian Procopius, in his work The Secret History, chapter 12, mentions the name of the resident of the city of Antioch called Macedonia. It was a dancer who was close to the Byzantine Empress Theodora. All this information indicates that it is highly probable that a number of prominent figures were born from the descendants of the settled Macedonians in Antioch. An indication of the possible Macedonian origin of St. Luke is the fact that he wrote in his work, The Acts of the Apostles, that after arriving in the Macedonian city of Philippi, he talked to some women. St. Luke writes all this in the first person plural, which means that he personally participated in conversations with the Macedonians. In what language did St. Luke speak to the Macedonians? It is well known that the Macedonians spoke a separate language than the Greeks, although rare literate Macedonians also used the coin written language. Can we suppose that St. Paul chose exactly St. Luke to stay in Macedonia 
only because of his Macedonian origin, that is, because of his knowledge of the Macedonian language, through which St. Luke could easily communicate with the Macedonians there. Let us say that the Bible also mentions other conversations between St. Luke and the inhabitants of Macedonia. We will mention one more interesting fact about the Macedonian ethnic origin of the Holy Evangelist Luke. There are serious foreign scholars who suppose that St. Luke was indeed of Macedonian origin. According to these researchers, St. Luke was not born in Antioch, but was born in Macedonia, although we also said that Antioch was also predominantly inhabited by Macedonians. As proof of the existence of this theory, we will mention the biography of St. Luke from the world-famous CD American Encyclopedia in Carta, titled Luke Saint where it is supposed that St. Luke was a Macedonian from Macedonia and that he had actually invited St. Paul to come to Macedonia. St. Luke welcomed St. Paul to Troas, a small Asia Minor town not far from Macedonia, and returned with him to Macedonia. We have confirmation of the existence of this theory in the famous American issue Bible Lands, written under the supervision of Dr. Clint Arnold of Talbot School of Theology as well. Here the assumption that St. Luke was a Macedonian from Macedonia and that he had invited St. Paul to come to Macedonia is also mentioned. It is known that St. Luke wrote his Bible works in the coin language. Careful scholars and analysts of the earliest transcripts of his works have made an interesting discovery. They found that St. Luke in the Acts of Epistles used an ancient Macedonian word that was not found in any other text found in the territory of present-day Greece. The same word has been found in numerous inscriptions throughout Macedonia, but not in the territory of present-day Greece. In the aforementioned issue of the Bible Lands, we read that Luke, in his explanations for Paul's stay in Solon, Thessalonica, uses a word for city executives, not found in any other text from the Greek literature. The same word has been found in numerous inscriptions throughout Macedonia. But what is this ancient Macedonian word used by St. Luke, which was not found in any literary ancient Greek text? That is the word polytax, whose etymology was precisely city administrators. St. Luke used this term in the Acts of Apostles, 17.6. The polytarchs were city administrators in ancient Macedonia. That is why this term is found exclusively on inscriptions on the territory of Macedonia. This institution is also found in inscriptions in the Macedonian colonies, that is territories that were under Macedonian rule. The Romans, after the occupation of Macedonia, retained this institution in the Macedonian cities and since Roman times, there have been inscriptions in this term on the territory of Macedonia as well. One might note that this term is Greek in its base. The term is actually a coinage containing the nouns city, polis, and ruler, archon. There are unequivocal ancient testimonies about the peculiarity of the ancient Macedonian language in relation to Greek, which we have already mentioned in the first part of this film. But the Macedonians and the Greeks are two neighboring nations constantly communicating and had intercultural influence. Therefore, over time, it is certain that the Macedonians accepted a number of words from the Greek language and vice versa. Evidence of this is the fact that the term polytarchos was a relatively new term in ancient Macedonia and it was only used during the time of the last Macedonian king Perseus 
the end of the 3rd and middle of the 2nd century BC, that is, over 200 years after the death of Alexander the Great. It is a time when Macedonians and Greeks, who have been under Macedonian occupation for centuries, due to living together in the same state of Macedonia, began to accept some words from one language to another. However, this word is a Macedonian coinage, as it did not exist in the Greek language at that time, because such an institution did not exist in the territory of present-day Greece, but only in Macedonia. The question arises, why did St. Luke use the ancient Macedonian term polytarchs in his The Acts of Apostles? Can we suppose that he really was a Macedonian from Macedonia who, as an indigenous citizen, knew very well about this Macedonian institution and therefore mentioned it in his works? If he was Greek, then we can probably assume that in keeping with the behaviour of the majority of Greek authors at the time, he would also replace the Macedonian term polytarchs with some similar familiar Greek term for city administrators. But he used exactly the original Macedonian term. Is this a strong indication of his Macedonian ethnic origin? We have already provided evidence of the dominant Macedonian ethnic character of the Asia Minor town of Antioch, which was built by Alexander the Great's Macedonian general Seleucus I. We have also cited ancient evidence that the Macedonians have been Antioch's dominant inhabitants for centuries. Because of all this, it is clear that some important Christianity events that happened in this city were related to the descendants of the Macedonians who lived there. First, let's say that many scholars believe that a fundamental event related to Christianity happened in Antioch, and that is the writing of the Gospel of Matthew. St. Matthew was one of the twelve apostles of Jesus, and he was a personal witness of Jesus' activities, which he wrote about. Early Christian writers regarded his Gospel as the oldest in the New Testament. There are two opinions on the place of where Matthew wrote his Gospel. One is that it was written in Palestine and the other is that it was written exactly in the Macedonian town of Antioch in about 70 AD. It is also known that two of the first three major Christian churches officially recognized in Nicaea in 325 were established in cities founded and inhabited by the Macedonians. These are the churches in Alexandria and Antioch, which, along with the one in Rome, were the first official Christian churches of the world. The city of Alexandria in Egypt is known to have founded by Alexander the Great himself, and there was also a large colony of Macedonians in this city. It is known that in Antioch, the pagans, that is, the descendants of the colonized Macedonians there, were christened first. In this connection, let's mention the remarkable fact that the term Christians was first used for the first time in history for the Macedonians in Antioch. In the Acts of Apostles 11, 25 to 26, about the presence of St. Paul and St. Barnabas in Antioch, we read, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And the term Catholic Church was first mentioned by an Antioch resident. It was one of the most prominent early Christians named St. Ignatius who was born in Antioch. It is interesting that St. Ignatius used the term Catholic Church for the first time in history which to this day has remained the name of one of the largest church communities in the world. Many Christian saints were also born in Antioch, and certainly some of them were descendants of the Macedonians who lived there. 
Now, let's point to a forgery made in the translation of a Bible text in which Greece is artificially and strongly favoured. It's about the Old Testament book of Daniel. This book was written at the end of the 7th or early 6th century BC. Verse 821 mentions a powerful king who will appear in the future. Many today assume that the prophet Daniel was referring to Alexander the Great, who appeared some 300 years after the book of Daniel was written. In many translations of this verse, this king is called the King of Greece. For example, the word Greece is mentioned in the English translation of Webster from 1833, then in Darby's translation from 1890, and in the 1901 American Standard Version of the Bible and others. In all these English translations, the term Greece is found. In a famous translation of the Bible by the Anglican Church known as the King James Bible of 1611, this term was modified and instead of Greece it is written Grecia. A translation of the Wai Reim from 1582 has gone furthest in the artificially forced pro-Greek determination of this verse. So here, the term Greece has been replaced by the term Greeks. Instead of the king of Greece, here it is written the king of the Greeks. Pro-Greek determinations of this verse from the book of the prophet Daniel are also found in translations in other languages. However, the truth is quite different. The prophet Daniel mentioned this king sometime around the end of the 7th and early 6th century BC, and at that time no Greece existed, either as a state nor as a formation. The unitary Greek state never existed in the ancient times, but instead there were several city-states that were often hostile to one another. This means that the prophet Daniel, who then lived in Babylon, could not mention the king of Greece, because in his day there was no Greece. On the contrary, in the earliest text of the book of Daniel, which was written in the Paleo-Hebrew language, it does not say the king of Greece at all, but it says the king of Yavan. So, who allowed the name Yavan to be forged and replaced with Greece, keeping in mind that in that time such a state did not even exist? Basically, this is an unprecedented falsification made in the Bible itself. We have said that such forgery is already widespread in many Bible translations, but not all. Some Bible translators were correct, so their translation is Yavan instead of the artificially infused and falsified term Greece. Thus, for example, the English translation of the Bible made by Robert Young, published in 1862, clearly states the King of Yavan and not the King of Greece. We have seen that there are also differences among the counterfeiters, which means that they too are not sure of their own forgery, intentional or not. For example, some have translated Yavan as Greece, some as Grecia, and some have even used the ethnonym Greeks. But what does the word Yavan mean? Why has anyone allowed this word to be equated with the term Greece, Greek? Is it perhaps an older name for the territory of today's Greece? We will say immediately that Yavan is not a geographical name, a former name of Greece, etc. But it is a personal name. In particular, it is the name of one of the sons of Japheth, who was the son of Noah. Yavan was the grandson of Noah's son. This is pointed out in the book of Genesis, chapter 10, where we read, 
This is the account of Shem, Ham and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. The sons of Japheth. Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech and Tiras. The sons of Gomer. Ashkenaz, Riphith and Tagarma. The sons of Javan. Elisha, Tarshish, the Kittim and the Rodanim. From these. The maritime peoples spread out into their territories by their clans within their nations. Each with its own language. So, according to the Old Testament, various nations came from Noah's grandchildren and their offspring, although it is not precise which person caused which nation. The pro-Greek scholars believe that the Greeks came from Yavan, and that is why the name Yavan was falsified in their translations with the term Greece, although there is no historical evidence for such claim. These translators refer to the Table of Nations, in which the ancient Jewish historian Josephus Flavius wrote that the descendants of Yavan were Greeks. Now, let's take a critical look at such claims. First, let's look at what is the Table of Nations that the pro-Greek translators refer to. We will say immediately that the Table of Nations is not a biblical text but it is a fictional literary creation of some later authors. We have seen that in the book of Genesis, in the Old Testament, there is no record of which nation was created by which descendant of Noah. Many centuries later, certain authors allowed, on the basis of this sentence, and without any solid evidence, to speculate what nation came from which of Noah's descendants. Such assumptions and speculations are known as the Table of Nations. Josephus Flavius is not the only author of Table of Nations. More precisely, there is not one but there are several tables of nations created by various authors. Apart from Josephus Flavius, there are also tables of nations whose authors are Saint Hippolytus, 3rd century, Jerome, end of 4th century, Isidore of Seville, 7th century, and other later authors. They all made the tables of nations centuries after the appearance of the original book of Genesis in the Old Testament that supposedly was completed around the 6th or 7th century BC. According to Josephus Flavius's The Table of Nations, written in the 1st century AD, that is, about seven centuries after the completion of the book of Genesis, Yavan was the ancestor of, and quote, Ionia and all Greeks. Of course, without any historical basis for this assertion. By the way, let's also mention that we have already cited data according to which Josephus Flavius clearly made a distinction between Macedonians and Greeks in his historical works as two separate nations. However, in the Table of Nations created by St. Hippolytus in the first half of the 3rd century, he writes that Yavan, through his son Kittim, was the ancestor of the Macedonians. St. Hippolytus, who came from Rome and is thought to be one of the greatest early Christian theologians, uh, considered the direct descendants of Yavan, beside the Macedonians, to include the Iberians, the Trojans, the Phrygians, and the Romans. That Yavan was the ancestor of the Macedonians, not the Greeks or Greece, is also written in the great Jewish Encyclopedia, published in 12 volumes between 1901 and 1906, where Yavan is clearly identified with Macedonia. It is known that in the ancient rabbinic texts. Alexander the Great was described as Alexander the Macedonian, and that in the Bible, 
Macedonia occurs under the name Kittim, who was one of Yavan's sons. This means that there is a biblical testimony that Macedonia is related to Yavan through his son, Kittim. This testimony is found in the first book of the Maccabees, 1 to 3. After Alexander, After son, son of Philip, the Macedonian, the Macedonian who, came who came from the land of Kittim, had defeated, had defeated King, King Darius, Darius of the, of the Persians, Persians and the Medes, and the Medes. He, succeeded he succeeded him as him king. As king. He had he previously had become, become king of, king of Greece. Greece. He fought, he fought many, many battles, battles conquered, conquered strongholds, strongholds, and put to put death the kings, kings of the earth. Of the earth. He, advanced he advanced to the ends of the earth and plundered many nations. When the, when the earth, earth became, became quiet, quiet before him, him he was exalted, exalted and his heart was lifted up. up. He, gathered he gathered a very, a very strong, strong army. army and ruled over countries, nations, and princes, and they became tributary to him. In this biblical testimony, we can clearly see that Alexander was called Macedonian, who, at that time, had already conquered Greece and was its master, and that he came from the land of Kittim, and since we know that Alexander's country is Macedonia and that Kittim was Yavan's son, this is biblical proof that Yavan should be related to Macedonia, not Greece. The question arises, why the Bible translators did not use the toponym Macedonia as a synonym for Yavan, although there is biblical testimony for this in the book of Maccabees. Why exactly did they choose the Greek toponym and even the Greek ethnonym when we saw that there was no historical basis for it? Still, it might have been best for these translators to stick to the original text and leave the original name Yavan in their translations rather than improvising on the basis of unproven speculation, among which they could rightfully choose Macedonia. This is another unjust pro-Greek tendency of some scholars in which Greece and the Greeks are baselessly attributed to something that does not belong to them. And this time, no more, no less, but in the Bible itself. We hope that this injustice will one day be fully corrected.